Thank you very much, uh, Aaron, for organizing this, Professor Hayes. Um, I'll get right in it because I understand I have no time at all. Uh, I, li <laughs> I lived in Ottawa oh, yeah, for... There's so many good things that we've talked about, so you can add to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I lived in Ottawa for four or five years, and each and every year I made uh, every effort to attend arguably Canada's most extensive and most elaborate Remembrance Day ceremony held on Elgin Street, just south of Parliament Hill. Some of you have probably seen it on TV. And at the time, I was studying history at the University of Ottawa, as Professor Hayes mentioned, doing my BA. And I had several good friends of mine who were members of the Canadian Forces, some of who had been or were about to be uh, deployed in combat roles. And as I attended these Remembrance Day ceremonies over the next few years, though, I noticed the demographic started to change rather quickly as more and more Canadian troops were sent to Afghanistan as part of uh, ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force, uh, the NATO coalition. Um, the experience of my generation, the people I, I hung around with, the meaning of military service and the image of what a veteran was, at least to me, began to change. But like countless other Canadians, war in at least a very abstract way entered my worldview subconsciously from a very early age. Perhaps this is why I went to uh, attend Remembrance Day ceremonies in the first place once I moved out on my own. But I played hockey and lacrosse at memorial arenas. I used to walk past the Vimy Ridge Parquet in Toronto, and I drove past and continue to drive past to visit my parents. The new Toronto Reformatory, which at that time I had no idea it was used to house 500 German POWs during the Second World War. So these vestiges of a far off place and a distant time were curious reminders of a past with which I wasn't familiar, but ones that uh, nonetheless influenced me in some profound ways, whether I knew it at the time or not. So I've begun with these ideas because I think they highlight a couple important elements for tonight's discussion. And one is that, quite simply, war enters our imagination at an early stage. The second is that the future of Remembrance Day isn't so certain because events, uh, what we remember and how we remember, are, uh, they change according to experiences of subsequent generations. So the veterans, uh, some of the people I know who returned from Afghanistan, have no connection whatsoever to the 11th of November. It's essentially devoid of meaning. Um, it's much more likely that uh, in one of my friend's cases, he'll remember uh, in 2008 when he was hit by a roadside bomb or some other equally traumatic combat experience. So I want everyone to keep those issues in mind when we move forward and when we uh, open it up to discussions. What I really want to talk about tonight is uh, some of the problems associated with Remembrance Day, not just in Canada, but in places where Canadians have fought and died. My own research focuses on the Second World War in the Netherlands and some of the ways in which both Canadians and Dutch civilians have given meaning to some very painful experiences uh, in their history, particularly in the Second World War. And uh, over the past few years, I've had the wonderful opportunity to, uh, to conduct research and travel fairly extensively in the Netherlands uh, basically due to your tax money. So thank you very much. <laughs> Consider this some kind of return on your investment. Um, and there, there are a couple of misconceptions about the Netherlands I want to disabuse right now. Uh, one is that all, uh, all Dutch people speak English. I found that to be patently false, uh, particularly when you, when you move beyond these densely uh, and urban populated areas in the, the airport. The other misconception, which is probably more relevant for tonight's discussion is that all Dutch people love Canada because we liberated large parts of the country in May 1945. So it's true that Canadian troops did liberate large parts of the country in, uh, in April and May 1945 and uh, the Dutch government quickly designated the 5th of May uh, as a liberation day, the Befreidingsdag. It was according to our uh, subsequent Canadian governments the sweetest of springs, or sweetest spring. Um, and the narrative goes something like this. Young Dutch women greeted Canadian troops with kisses, some of which led to illegitimate children, some of which led to marriages. And uh, Dutch people showered troops with what little food they had because everyone was starving. Uh, and the civilians displayed a level of generosity unbeknownst to the Canadians as they marched through uh, places in Belgium and France. What's more important in this narrative, something that buttresses the narrative, is that Princess Marguerite was born in, in Ottawa during the war and uh, Ottawa designated 
the Ottawa hospital as extraterritorial so she could retain her Dutch citizenship. And as a result of this, we're showered with more tulips, which is uh, in turn a good sign, a, a sign of good relations between our two states. That's an oversimplification, but that's the sweetest spring in a nutshell. Now, the narrative isn't wrong, but it's not exactly representative either. <clears throat> What we remember about the Second World War almost always involves uh, excluding certain narratives from our largely conventional, largely official ones, the so-called Sweetest Spring if we're going to talk about the Netherlands. But if we talk about the Second World War, not just in the Netherlands, but elsewhere too, we need to start thinking about liberations in the plural as opposed to one singular event. Because liberation uh, came to towns and villages unevenly at different times. Uh, the people in the countryside experienced both Nazi occupation and Allied liberation uh, in, a, in a different way than those in the cities. So, for instance, the liberation, and I use that term very loosely, uh, the liberation of the southernmost province of the Netherlands called Zeeland, after which New Zealand uh, gets its name, represents one of those alternative narratives that Canadians tend to forget. When we think about the Second World War, images of of Dieppe, maybe, uh, but usually storming Juneau Beach, the Normandy campaign, those images come to mind. The Battle for the Scheldt, which took place between October and November 1944, is much less uh, lesser known among Canadians, but certainly no less important. Uh, basically, I'm going to spare you the operational and, and strategic details, but uh, the First Canadian Army was tasked with clearing the approaches to Antwerp. So if you look in the, in the bottom right hand corner, Antwerp is there. Um, it was a port that the Allies really, really needed to open because many of the ports on which they had previously relied were damaged as a result of poor weather as well as fighting. Uh, the, the previous ports were channel ports on the, uh, in western France. Um, basically, the Canadians need to clear the approaches. Antwerp lies 80 kilometers inland and uh, starting on the 5th of September when Antwerp was actually captured. About 100,000 German troops, elements of 15th Army, were ferried across the Wester uh, Scheldt there uh, from the 6th of September to the 20th of September. And therefore, these islands right here were very heavily defended, very heavily defended. And you're going to hear me talk about Valkyren, which is the, the little saucer-shaped island that sticks out in the North Sea uh, the furthest. So Germans heavily fortify this area. Hitler declares it a, uh, a fortress, and the Canadians need to figure out just how to get rid of these Germans. So Canadian Lieutenant General Guy Simmons, British Naval Commander Admiral Bertram Ramsey, among others, they need to figure out how to dislodge the Germans as well as neutralize the heavy coastal batteries. Simmons and Ramsey proposed something pretty, what we would call now controversial, but innovative at the time. They actually want to use uh, heavy bombers to bomb the dikes and flood the island. Keep in mind, nowhere in this region exceeds 2.2 2 meters in altitude or 10 feet. So any type of flooding would be quite catastrophic. So they, they proposed breaching the dikes of Valkyren uh, by bombing them, sinking it, and hopefully flooding out and killing Germans. So on the 2nd of October, 1944, the Allies dropped thousands of these over the various islands that look over the river. These pamphlets call for an immediate evacuation, warn your neighbors, leave without delay, and carry only what you can wear. Uh, among other things, they also say, quote, it's highly probable that the enemy troops and installations on your island will soon be exposed to a severe and prolonged aerial bombardment, and not only the aerial bombardment, but also the danger of flooding threatens your life and that of your families. So the following day, on the 3rd of October, uh, the RAF and Bomber Command initiate a series of, of sorties, 2,219, and drop over 10,000 tons of ordnance on the island of Valkyren, which is about 18 kilometers wide. As I said before, it's, it's below sea level. Uh, immediately on the 3rd of October, 152 civilians from this town are killed instantly, but 30 more die later that day. Uh, and out of a population of about 2,000, that's 10% roughly of, of a town's population. And uh, we know that surrounding villages on this island experience similar casualties. So by the 28th of October, 44, this island is underwater. It's effectively sunk, uh, and the, the Allies cover 
16,000 of the island's 18,000 hectares. So there's very little surface area of this place that is dry. And at this point, I should say that the Germans also use flooding. I'm not trying to paint a, a really terrible picture of the Allies. But the Germans use flooding, but by nature of being there first, they can conscript uh, Dutch labor uh, and Dutch knowledge on how to control floods. Um, so my central point is that water mobilized as a weapon deeply affected how this region would remember war. And after the Battle of the Scheldt in, uh, in November 44, a massive level of destruction, uh, over 50,000 of the provinces, uh, about 70,000 hectares had been flooded with salt water. So liberation made this, uh, almost every home on Valkyrie uninhabitable. Even until the 1960s, there were these temporary homes uh, called Brownzell homes, which were kind of shacks, one room shacks that uh, families had to live in. Uh, the last family to leave one of those was 1963. So you can uh, imagine the legacy in this particular part of the Netherlands and the level of, of destruction. And in many ways, I'm going to use a cheesy phrase, but museums are the custodians of memory. I, I, it's a terrible phrase, but it works. Uh, they're keepers of memory, and they, they can dictate how the public receives our history. The Canadian War Museum, for example, uh, tells a narrative that excludes altogether the Allied bombardment in this particular battle that caused so much destruction. Instead, they, acted, uh, they actually say that the Germans were the ones who, who blew up the dikes in this particular part of the Battle of the Scheldt. It's amazing. Um, if you go to this place uh, today, Zeeland, in particular, Veskapel, there's a Polder House Museum, it's called, which uh, is situated kind of ironically next to the dike that was breached on the 3rd of October. And it offers a stark contrast to how Canadians understand uh, liberation. In this narrative, there is no joyous reception of the Allies, no euphoria among the local population. Instead, the exhibit begins by explaining how civilians sought safety from the bombardment by fleeing to mills and cellars where many either drowned or died. And a, in a very eerie way, a large poster hangs in the middle of, of, uh, of the main floor with photographs of every civilian killed in the Allied bombardment on the first day. Um, so this is what liberation meant for this part of the Netherlands, and it's much different than what we, when we th think of when we talk about liberation. I want to switch gears for a moment and talk about Canadian remembrance and whether it has changed over time. Uh, since I'm talking about the Second World War, it's worthwhile to ask the question, does Remembrance Day mean the same thing as it did 20, 40, 60, 80 years ago, uh, or has it evolved over time? And I think David did a wonderful job uh, telling us about that. Matthew Halton, who is the CBC war correspondent in Europe during the Second World War, had the opportunity to reflect on Remembrance Day in, in 1944. So just as information about the, the battle in the Scheldt was coming to light, he talks about how in September he was with a, a British armored division, I believe, and he drove past Arras where, in France where he eventually saw the two pylons of, of the Vimy Ridge Memorial to the Can Canadians from the First World War. And he speaks about the First World War in some pretty curious ways. He called the region that bloody wasted bog that he drove through in almost an hour without losing a life, whereas a million men of the empire and uh, a million and a half Frenchmen had, had been killed in just a few short years. And as he proceeds past these First World War battlefields, he says his thoughts, his memories, always go back to Caen and Falaise. So uh, events that were more relevant to him as a witness to war, someone who had lived through the fighting uh, and endured that level of chaos. He said, quote, and if there were ghosts around Vimy Ridge when we swept past that day, I wonder if they were saying something like this. Listen, what are you going to do after this war? Perhaps you're going to build a memorial twice as high as this one on the road to Caen Falaise to commemorate our sons, the dead and damned battalions, the Black Watch and the North Nova Scotias and the rest. Arras, Bopam, Ypres, Vimy Ridge. That was the anthem of the doomed youth of one generation. Bretville, Caen, Tilly, Falaise. That's the anthem for the doomed youth of another. We died, our sons died. What are you going to do? He then goes on to say that war is something to be ashamed of. It's pretty powerful stuff, um, but we can, we can interpret Halton's reflection in a number of ways. But the underlying idea is that contemporary experiences often eclipse existing narratives of memory and remembrance. And if they don't eclipse them, they certainly try to compete with one another or maybe coexist. 
For those veterans thinking about their experiences in not just the Netherlands, but Italy, North Africa, France, Belgium, maybe even Hong Kong, what impact did Vimy Ridge or Passchendaele really have on the ways in which they remember their war? How relevant was the 11th of November after May 1945? And what did the First World War mean to those uh, who had experienced the second? Clearly, what we remember has changed over time. Just like in the Netherlands, national forms of remembrance in Canada are contentious. Today, very few Canadians, if any at all, have a real connection to the First World War. Veterans of that era are now long gone. As we approach the 70th anniversary of D-Day and the Normandy campaign, more and more attention has been given to the veterans of the Second World War, rightfully so, as organizations and governments try to record the memories of this generation. The Juno Beach Center in Normandy is uh, just one example of that, uh, but there are others. As a way to conclude my talk, I want to broach some questions and ideas about Remembrance Day in Canada and beyond, and perhaps we can address them later, if there's time, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> the memorializing of events in the past serves to simplify. It serves to compress historical and complicated experience because memory necessarily involves selection. It serves to make things easier. When Canadian governments talk about the First World War, they employ Vimy Ridge as a way to describe how Canada united as a nation. In so doing, we're forced to forget that the heavy losses inflicted on Canada at Vimy Ridge, about 10,600, forced our government to invoke conscription, which effectively tore apart French and English Canada. Far from being a unifying event, this is probably one of the most divisive in Canada's history. But we also ignore the rounding up and internment of ethnic communities like Ukrainians, Austro-Hungarians for what we would now call national security reasons. Additionally, when we think of men who served the empire and fought in those hellish conditions of the trenches, we surely don't imagine thousands of them being Sikhs or Muslims. As Matthew Halton recalled in November 1944, the experiences of the Second World War had overshadowed those of the first. Canadian involvement in Dieppe, Normandy, the Netherlands, and elsewhere resonates much more with the current generation because we might have a more tangible connection to those events. We might even have relatives who can still recall those tumultuous years. <clears throat> but here too, we remember the action of Canadians and allies at the expense of other narratives. We sometimes forget about the internment of Japanese Canadians, and if that's the case, we certainly don't care much for the internment of German Canadians. In the same way, while we celebrate the liberation of the Netherlands, very few people recognize the level of death and destruction that accompanied some liberations. The evolution of memory and of Remembrance Day is an extremely amorphous process. It's inherently connected to our own generation and how we choose to write our history. Perhaps one day the First World War will be as relevant for Canadians as the Crimean War is for Britons today. But for now, while we remember the actions of Canadians during the Second World War, we should be mindful that the future of Remembrance Day is not so certain. Memory is intimately associated with physical reminders, the monuments, memorials, and the vestiges we attach meaning to and what's left behind once war ends. Those are the things that intrigue us, the things that pique our curiosities, and those are the things which allow war to enter our imaginations at such an early stage in our lives. While we demolish and dismantle our internment camps and residential schools in Canada, we sanctify the ground of the fallen in Europe. We include events in our narrative at the expense of other seemingly less important ones, ones that perhaps bring us less comfort. The supreme irony is that the history of memory is one that always involves forgetting. Thank you. That was Kirk Goodlett, formerly of the University of Waterloo. <laughs>